Good afternoon. Today I'm going to be introducing Clive van der Berg. He is one of South Africa's most iconic artists, currently working not only um, creating amazing art that is relevant to now, but he's actually been making art for many, many years. So there's quite a legacy of art that Clive has created over the years. Um, good afternoon, Clive, and thank you for joining us. Hello, Lucian. Very nice to be with you. Clive, you have chosen to discuss this African landscape um, number six with us today. It is a huge art piece. The um, dimensions are quite large. So this smaller image doesn't really quite take the complexity of it or into account or do much justice in that sense. So um, I would really encourage the kids to get to art galleries to look at these paintings in their large size. It is very complex. There's a lot going on here. Could you tell us a little bit about what was going on in this specific painting? Okay, so so the, the best place to start is, is with the title. So African Landscape, uh, number five, and then Gold Below in brackets. It's made in 2020. I think of it as my COVID year painting because it did take me most of the years. As you say, it's a very, very complex painting. It chose the title African Landscape and it's a, it's a thematic title. There are many paintings in this series because I wanted to indicate that I am thinking about the tradition of landscape painting in South Africa. And in a sense, I'm deconstructing it. So if we look at the, 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 the scale of the painting and the structure of the painting, it's composed of three separate canvases. Uh, you can see there's a top section, which is that large kind of reddish colored uh, part of the painting. And then there's a division. And below that, there is a, on the left hand side, there's a kind of gray, kind of blue section, then another red section, and then a bright yellow section. That is the gold below. And we'll get to, to the, what the gold signifies in, in a little while. It's an extremely complex painting. There's a lot going on. Uh, if you look at the top section there, there are a series of incidents. There are lots of little figures happening, uh, doing things there. We're not always sure what the, the action is, but there's a sense, a common sense of agitation in the figures there. There are many different incidents. I call it episodic. They're not connected necessarily, and we're not sure whether these inc incidents that we're looking at come from the present or the past. Now, related to that is the, the structure of the painting. When I speak to students, I often say to them, the first decision you ever make is about the structure of a work. How big is it? In other words, what is the spectator's bodily relationship to the painting? Is it bigger than them? Are they the same size as, uh, as, the, as the painting is? If there's a figurative element in the painting, are they looking at it at something which is their own scale or which is smaller than them. If there are lots of figures smaller than them, it's a very different perspective. The perspective is from far away and it gives a kind of historical sense to the painting rather than a portrait uh, painting, which is a one-on-one -on -one relationship. The divisions in the, uh, the why I've used different, different uh, canvases and put them together is a complex one. It's a reference back to a Renaissance tradition, which is the, the Renaissance use of the predella, which is a series of small paintings under the larger narrative. So you'll see I've got the larger narrative at the top and then smaller paintings, smaller incidents below. And these inform the larger narrative or comment on the larger narrative in one way or another not necessarily in a logical kind of way. In Renaissance painting, it was usually logical. Here, uh, the, 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 the logic might be somewhat hard to find, although there is always a logic. The other thing it does, it is allows me to speak to one of my constant themes, and that is that there is not only an above ground landscape, and particularly in Johannesburg, there is a below ground landscape as well. We're a mining town. We're reminded of this every time the earth shakes or every time we hear a blast from a mine. There is a whole world happening underneath the ground that we walk on. And indeed, this 
industry below us is the reason for us all to be here. It has moved populations to Johannesburg through migrant labor systems. When there were mine dumps dotted around Johannesburg and there still are in some parts of, of the city, we were reminded of the volume of, of earth that was taken from underground, processed, the gold extracted, and these man-made hills which dot uh, our landscape give us some sense of, of, of that. So you'll see that there, there are incidents happening below the, 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 main, the main painting. And this also allows us to talk about not only the underground, but it allows us to think about the past's relationship to the present tense. So we don't, when I make these paintings, uh, I, I, I contradict the traditional landscape tradition of having one perspective, one viewpoint, and one time frame. There are multiple time frames in this painting, and they're mixed up. There is some logic to the fact that the un underneath sections of the painting refer to the past, and I do that quite consciously because I'm saying effectively, or one of the, the things that the painting is saying is that the present tense is deeply affected by our actions in the past and the consequences of those actions are bearing fruit now. Simple, state, simple but very complex, complex thing. The um, surface of the landscape, you'll notice, first of all, there's no horizon line. There's only a horizon line in, a, in, in one of the, the little sections in the predella at the bottom there where, where there is one horizon line. And in fact, that's a reference to a historical landscape photograph. Uh, it's one of the battles of, um, of one of the frontier war battles, battle sites. So again, there's a, there's a historical reference and the uh, theme of contestation of, of, of land, of possession, and the meaning of land, different meanings of land to different population groups and different individuals is hinted at there. I seldom use uh, a kind of topographic view of the landscape where there is a lot of surface incident. I strip the surface incident off the landscape. So you'll see there's very little anecdotal reference to landscape. There's no trees, there's no rocks, etc. It's as if all of that has been stripped off and what we're seeing is the bare earth. It's contrasted in the middle of the painting, the top section where you can, in that green section, where you can see um, a, a, little, uh, a, a little bit of incident. So that's a kind of outline of what, of what the painting is about. From a technical perspective, um, I really appreciate the fact that you really have um, used the directional forces very well to guide the viewer's eye around. We've got the gold that moves our eye around and a strong sense of line as well. So the painting really does read easily from a viewer's perspective you know you you, you although there's a um, sense of almost chaos at the top the yeah. yellow and the sort of the grays and then the strong lines really do help to guide the viewer's eye and that kind of makes a sense to all this movement um and the and the, and the very gestural mark making so it does yeah. hold it together very, very well. I like us particularly as well on the left hand side, those like sort of dripping lines, how it kind of mimics the shafts and really draws exactly. your eyes down into the depth. So although there's a very sort of abstract expressionistic quality to this painting, like you say, upon study, you can see that it's very intentional and yeah. it, um, it's, there's a lot of symbolic quality to it as well as these more intuitive response um, marks that um, allow yeah. us to kind of get a feeling of the emotion here. The chaos that you create with the lines, is that um, deliberately speaking into a South African identity at all? Yeah, so I'm, I'm pleased you brought up line because it is, you know, we could spend uh, a lot of time just thinking about what the significance of line is in any of my works. The straight line obviously is a signifier of order. And we think about where the first straight lines in the country. Now, the first um, 
division of land is what, what's called Van Riebeck's Hedge, uh, where he planted a hedge in the company gardens in Cape Town. And in a sense, it was the first mapping of, of the country. And mapping has gone on, division of land has gone on and multiplied uh, ever since then. So these lines refers, refer to maps in part, but they also refer, as you correctly understood, to shafts, to the mapping of the underground. And so those vertical lines are there to draw us, to, to, to make us understand this relationship between the above ground and the below ground, but also between present and past. There are other lines which are disconnected to, to any kind of direct reference as if it's as if they are floating, but have been disconnected to their original function. So the sense of order and disorder is a constant theme in the painting. So, like I said, it's, it's your constant circular motion of your eye takes your, your eye around the painting all the time and you see more and more layers into it. And I think that yes. also really helps to support this echo that you have of going to the past, coming back yeah. into the present, going to the past, coming back into the present. Um, another aspect of landscape, but completely separate from this painting, but for which you have made a huge contribution in the South African art world, is your physical presence on the actual land in terms of some of the public spaces that you've um, been part of creating. Could you speak to us maybe about some of that? Like, for instance, your okay, so I think on Ocean Hill and Peace Park. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's very important that our public space reflects a, a political condition. Now, historically, public spaces have celebrated apartheid and colonial heroes. If we go into the city squares of pretty much any town in this country or city in this country, they would have been populated by colonial luminaries and apartheid luminaries. And this gives a very distorted and very particular view obviously the, the, the victor's view of what our history has been. So post 94, I thought, I thought it was very important that I give a lot of energy to working with a collective of people we're called Trace, and they're architects and engineers and uh, designers to try and transform public space in, in, in the way that we could. And we've done that mainly through museums, post 94 museums. So we've worked on Constitution Hill, the Mandela Foundation, the Workers Museum, uh, the most recent one is the Holocaust and Genocide Center, which looks at the Rwandan genocide as well as the Holocaust. And these give a very different, these museums give us a very different idea of what our history has been. And I think that is, the, I see that as an important part of my function as an artist. It's a very different responsibility to my responsibility in the studio. In the studio, I'm alone, I'm, I'm, I'm responsible to my own thinking and to the tradition of studio practice. Working with, 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 with in, in public space is a totally different responsibility. You are not responsible only to yourself. In fact, you're, you're only very negligibly responsible to yourself. You have a large audience, you have a large team and you have a client. And how you define that client is very important. There's a direct client, but there's an indirect client. And that is, our, that is our citizens, our fellow citizens. And so I feel that responsibility very, very uh, powerfully. And I think a lot of my effort in public space has been directed and guided by the constitution, which I see as the great postmodern document of our time and which I think we must all try and adhere to and uphold and propagate as powerfully as we possibly can within our individual capacities. Aesthetically, how do you find that you have manifested um, this sort of public sense in your um, public spaces? So for instance, um, like making visual choices that reflect the South African culture, because we have such a complex culture. We are complex in that we are made up yeah. of many nations and we are complex in that we have a very complex story. So how, how do you make aesthetic decisions? And can you maybe give us some examples of aesthetics decisions that you've made in creating these public spaces? 
Well, your first responsibility is to, is to your subject. So that will determine your, the aesthetic choices that, that you make. So if I can think of two examples, one from the Holocaust uh, and, and Genocide Center, um, which I'll speak about first. There's a great deal of information about the Holocaust. There is less about the Rwandan genocide, but one of the uh, most moving series of objects which we received from Rwanda were clothes that were found at the sites of massacres. And the question was, how do you display these, these objects? Because these are clothes which belong to people who died in, in these, these massacres. So, so these are relics. Um, and I decided that I had two, there were, there were two things that needed to be done. The one was to, to, to make the garment stand in for the person so that when you looked at the garment, you had a sense that somebody wore this. So the scale of the, the garment was terribly important, whether it was worn by a child, by an adult, by a man, by a woman. So that had to be revealed. I had to display them that that, that, that was revealed so that each person who came to the museum and looked at that display could identify with them because bodily identification is one of the most powerful tools that any artist, any designer can use. We all relate somatically. In other words, we all instinctively relate to size of clothing, gender of clothing. And we have an empathy, an empathetic relationship uh, determined by, by, by these responses. So that was the one responsibility, but the other was to represent community. So I decided to display the clothes collectively, but in such a way that you could read them individually. So, so that was the, the aesthetic, that guided my, my, my decision uh, there. If we take another example, say at the, um, the woman's jail uh, at Constitution Hill, we, we proceeded by listening to stories. Most of your time is spent listening. It's not about your voice in, in, in that situation. It's entirely different to studio practice. You are merely a conduit. You have to listen to the story and then find a way to show that story with as little intervention of yourself as possible. You've almost got to be invisible. Of course, that's never entirely possible, but what you want to, 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 to make explicit is what has happened to the people who are the center of this, of this narrative. And one of the, the, the most moving stories that, that we heard was from a woman who was arrested in, during, uh, during past laws, I mean, because of past laws, and she was carrying a plastic bag and there was food in the plastic bag which she had bought for her children. And her, her narrative was about worrying about what happened to the food. And so we used the plastic bag as the signifier of, of, that, of that incident. And then there was obviously text which accompanies that, but that's all that is displayed in the case a modest plastic bag, but it's, a, it's, a ba it's, a, it's an object which anybody who has ever shopped for a child or for, for a dependent will know the significance of. It is the carrier of food. And the loss of that is the loss of your, I suppose, security. The, your security, but it's also the loss of your demonstration of, of affection for your child. Yeah. And your protection of them. So that's those are two examples of, of how we I take my grade Sorry. 11s to the Constitution Hill every year. Unfortunately, we couldn't go last year because of COVID. And when the minute you started talking about a strong narrative, I immediately knew you were going to talk about that particular story. Because every year I've got yeah. this noisy bunch of kids and they're very excited and they're having a great time and everything's really interesting. But when we get to the women's jail, you can just hear the volume drop. And then 
Their guide will right, tell the right. story about what goes on there. And then they're given free time to walk around. And by the time they walk out of there, they are dead quiet. They are so emotionally right. affected by that. So it is a very, you have chosen very effective ways of portraying that story that, and like you say, to humanize those stories, to humanize that history. And for instance, as well, that yeah. um, there's that bit where the, 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 the size of the shacks or the, 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 the shacks, oh. the, 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 yeah, the, the outside where the kids who were arrested in 1976 yes. were put in the, I make the kids stand inside there because they're the same age as those kids were. And then they get this real sense of something which is just given to them in an abstract in class, how it becomes real. And I think that's a wonderful yes. power of art. It makes stories yes. real. And I think another thing that you yes. are very um, passionate about and which you do a lot of art is marginalized um, parts of society and by kind of lifting or giving them their voice they become more um noticed more seen and you talk about empathy a lot and what i've read about your work empathy is quite important for you you know to for, for viewers to engage with the subject um which brings me up to two particular themes that you deal with which we don't often talk about or they're still ironically enough in today's day and age resistance and taboo and that is gender related issues and particularly with queer and um, gay issues in art and um, yeah. HIV and I know that you may have made art figurative art beautiful um, artworks that relate to this um, would you like to be able to talk about that for a little bit Sorry, I missed that last part of your sentence. You, okay. you um, connection broke. When you bro. talk about gender related or gender issues in art, so often the um, issues that are spoken about are um, feminist issues and issues related to, um, you know, the male female um, politics. But your art has also looked at right. um, queer art and um, queer issues, and I thought yes. maybe you would like to yes. touch on that. Yeah, very much. Um, so I'm, I'm queer myself and I've, um, I've lost, uh, I, I'm an old guy, <laughs> I'm in my 60s. So in the 1980s, um, crisis, so I lost many friends uh, to, to that epidemic. Uh, and of course, it has carried on from then, still part of very much part of our, our lives now. But one of the, the appalling things about um, HIV AIDS, as opposed to COVID, was that people's lives were never validated. Particularly in the, those early days in the 80s, people had to die alone. There was no societal um, support. There was absolutely no government support. In fact, there was the very opposite. There was denial. Um, there was scorn for, 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 for these people. So it's been one of my concerns since then to make art which gives a voice to those people. And part of, of, of that is, is a, a kind of recognition that we live with ghosts. And there are, our world is full of, of, of the ghosts of, of, of people who have left us and who are in a kind of limbo because their lives have, have not been properly remembered and properly memorialized and they have died unloved. And much of my work has been about paying tribute to these people and trying to give them some kind of voice. So a lot of my work is meant, uses the word ghost in the title or limbo, um, uh, which is the, the state of being in between heaven and earth to indicate that we're always in the presence of the people who have left us. They, they haven't left us. They're always part of our lives. They're in the very fabric of our landscapes. Um, our memories of them is prompted by sound, by music, by recognizing something in the landscape that they might have loved, a particular flower or a view or whatever it happens to be. So, so paying tribute to these people and giving voice to them 
and and being defiant about um, the fact of of queer people um, up until very recently, and even now, it's a it's it's a contested uh, place of empathy that queer people have been profoundly marginalized in this country. Apartheid wasn't only about the marginalization by race. It was, it maintained patriarchy by excluding queerness. It was, and, and excluding women for that, for that matter. It was very much part of, of its whole logic. So these two themes have coexisted um, and they are the main themes of, of my life. And I, I, I speak about them as love and land. Because love and its, its uh, uh, what I call its undertoes, love and its consequences um, is, is, is a profound part of, uh, of my life. How, how we develop a vocabulary for, for love that has no societal support or didn't have societal support that it is now thankfully written into our constitution. That doesn't mean that there's necessarily wide acceptance for it or universal acceptance for it, but it's, it's, a, it's a profound piece of legislation. Do you think that the artist has um, a responsibility to um, tell stories? And I mean, I know the answer is most likely yes, but I would like you to just expand on why possibly you think it is the responsibility of the artist to tell the stories of the people that you identify with that you have this empathy relationship with why why is it important to record these things you know Lucian, I, I i often say to people one of the the, the absolute one of the the, the, the fantastically complex and wonderful functions of art is that it can say things which nothing else can say. And it can say things in a way which no other medium can say. So journalism might tell you about um, the HIV crisis, but it's not necessarily going to give you the empathetic understanding of another person's plight that art can do. And I think seeing an image can affect people very profoundly and can alert them to something which they might not even be able to give words to. And I often say to students, isn't that a wonderful thing that art can make you feel something which you cannot give words to immediately. You know you've been moved, you know that you've been affected by an image, by, by something you can't name, by color, by texture, by the combination of all of these things, by the the narrative capacities of art, but also by the abstract capacities of art, by the power of, of a mark to move you, by the power of color to move you for reasons you don't necessarily understand. And it's a very complex thing looking at a painting or any artwork, but it's that capacity which, which I think that I must use and which I do have, I suppose, I, you know, it's, my, it's my one talent. I can, I can use that vocabulary. And uh, I know how much I have been moved by art. I know how much as a child looking at reproductions of paintings, how profoundly moved I was and how I understood things. I came from a working class family, so I never had a great vocabulary for complex um, political or psychological issues. I knew that I didn't fit into my family and I knew that I could find solace and some kind of sense of place by looking at art. And I think if, it, if art can do that to people, particularly to young people who might feel misplaced, then that is, that is a fantastic capacity for the visual. And yes, so as an artist, I feel it is my responsibility. And of course, one of the most powerful things about art is it is a lasting a piece of evidence of our yeah. current state of being, which is, you know, like you say, the, the past is speaking into the present, but we're carrying that conversation into the future. Um, we know about yes, past exactly. civilizations because of the art that they left behind, and therefore we are creating legacy yeah. 
with the art that we are currently creating. Yeah, and I think you know one of the one of the the very important thing for for young learners to to think about is how do you develop a vocabulary for the present tense? It's quite easy to make art about the past because history has packaged it for us. But the present tense is very confusing. and They're living through the present tense. And if they can figure out a way to make, to develop a vocabulary, a visual vocabulary for the complexity of their own lived experience, they will be doing something wonderful. Wow. And that would be my challenge to I am I'm sure that um, the kids watching this are going to be very inspired. I am extremely grateful that we've been able to have this conversation. I'll be honest, when I look, look you up and I find research um, literature about you, it is often um, very academic and it's often very short. It's not deep enough. It will be an article about a specific thing. And I feel today we've really been able to give some flesh to a lot of your yeah. ideas and we've really been able to get to grips with um, so much of your art and for me myself I've got a far deeper appreciation of your work now and I'm sure that kids watching this will as well and I really appreciate it and I thank you so much for your time is there any last thoughts that you would like to add or are you good no I think I think I think I'm fine um I think you know, for, for, for kids making art and embarking on a, on a career, and never underestimate it. Don't dumb it down and don't try and make it too easy. I think much, much contemporary culture um, is, kind of, is, is kind of simplistic. And I think one of the great capacities of art is, is, is its complexity. So, as I said earlier, figure out a way to, to develop a, a vocabulary for your particular experience. That would be always be my challenge to, to a young person starting out. Thank you. And of course, yeah, and every person is a unique voice as well. So every artwork will, every exactly. artist will make their own unique art. Thank you so much yes. for this conversation and um, yeah, I look forward, maybe later on in the year, we'll have another conversation with some of your other works to, to broaden the spectrum then of the knowledge of your work. Sure. sure, with pleasure, absolute pleasure. Always happy to do this. Thank you.